Let's turn to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 1. Probably one of the most read portions of Scripture in the Bible because people start out, I'm going to read my Bible through, and they read Genesis chapter 1. And usually maybe by about chapter 3 or 4, they quit. Um, but uh, Genesis chapter 1, we're going to read verses uh, 26, 27, 31, and then chapter 50, verse 26. It says, and God said, let us, well, let's read verse 1 too as well. I forgot that one. That's an important one, don't you think? Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over fish, the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and of the cat over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image and in the image of god created he him male created he him uh, male and female created he them Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 50, verse 26. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you've allowed us to be here. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the word that you have given uh, that is written out. We thank you the, for the word that came, who was born in Bethlehem and lived out the scriptures, fulfilled the scriptures, died, was buried and rose again. And our faith in that word will determine our outcome. Lord, we just ask that you would help us to faithfully preach your word today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my, my heart be acceptable in your sight. We ask that you would save any that are lost. We ask that you would stir up your people. We ask that you would uh, reclaim the backslidden. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name that you would receive the honor and the praise in the glory. Amen. Amen. I'd like to preach from creation to a coffin. From creation to a coffin. Uh, I'm going to do something or attempt to do something this morning that uh, I don't do very often. I'm like to preach an entire book to you this, this morning. Uh, I've done that before with uh, like the book of Jude, perhaps, and uh, uh, the book of uh, Philemon. Uh, but those letters uh, only entail one chapter. This is a 50-chapter book that I'm going to endeavor to preach this morning. Am I going to hit everything? No. I'm going to do a, a kind of a synopsis. I'm actually going to do a general synopsis, and then I'm going to uh, look more specifically at one point, and then finally even more specifically at the final point. So we're going to view it, then we're going to turn up the, the, the magnifier and look a little closer at something, then look a little closer at something else. But I believe in the book of Genesis we can see basically a synopsis, an outline of a person's life. Now I told you that, that we were, the, the title was From Creation to a Coffin. Uh, we have the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. It talks about in the beginning was God and he created the heavens and the earth, we, we, uh, the heaven and the earth, rather, we, we read about the creation of mankind there in genera uh, Genesis chapter 1. And then when we get to the final chapter, in the final verse, it talks about Joseph, how he died and how he was placed in a coffin. We see in the book of Genesis, we see a Christian creation. We see birth. We see that it is something that is ordained of God. All birth, all life 
is ordained of God. All murder is murder. It is the killing of an individual. We talked about the issue that's before uh, the voters of Kentucky, whether they are going to stand up for the lives of these innocent babies that have not yet lived or whether they're going to... I think the, the big problem is not going to be uh, the, the yeses or noes. I think it's going to be the indifference, uh, the ones that really don't care enough to go out and vote. But we understand that God created man, created woman, created them, it says, in his own image. Now, um, I've pointed this out before, but uh, when it gets to the... Uh, the birth of Seth is that he was uh, created in Adam, Adam's image because that image was marred by sin. Now, I believe we are still created in God's image is that God is three persons. He is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. And man is body, soul, and spirit. That there are three that make up God. And there are one and there are three that make up Men and women, and they are also one. But we see that, that people are born. We see that everything was good, God said there, and that uh, after he looked over everything he created, everything was good, everything was perfect, everything was right. But then we get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. And six, and I'm just doing a, 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 you know, you can look at these things, but I, once again, I'm just doing a general overview right now. Uh, we're not going to be reading many verses. We'd be here all day if I read all the verses in uh, Genesis, uh, the 50 chapters of Genesis. But we see what happens in chapter 3. Very well known. When we think of Adam, what do we think of? We think of the fall. You know, we don't think of the perfection he was born in. We may occasionally think of the garden, but the first thing probably we think of is the sin. We picture Adam. When we picture him, we picture this man covered with fig leaves, trying to cover up his sin on his own, trying to cover up what he had done. Man sins. Man sinned quickly. We, we, and, and honestly, I don't know how many years had, had passed between the creation of Adam. And uh, it really doesn't matter because man was ageless at that time. Man was eternal at that time. But we see the fall of man. And when, and when we see the fall of man, we also see judgment. Uh, Paul said in the book of Romans that uh, by sin, death entered into the world. He told us that the wages of sin is death. But he also told us the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have inherited that sin nature from Adam. In the fall of Adam, we also see the fall of ourselves. We were uh, born with the nature to sin, with the desire to sin. And then we are sinners by practice when we actually sin. We see a few chapters later, and I didn't bother to write that down. I think it's in uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4, yes, we see... A picture of the Savior. Now we already have a picture of the Savior when God, uh, uh, there in chapter 3, he had um, covered Adam and Eve's nakedness with animal skins. We see that, that uh, someone died in order to cover their sins. And we see Christ in that, how he died. That he had to give his life, uh, his innocent life, just as these were innocent animals who had not sinned as a covering for the sin of mankind. But we see the first person in Genesis who is a picture of the Savior. This is the son, Seth. We know the story. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, when we get to the fall, and I've said this before, we, you know, they, they ate of a piece of fruit, and we generally think, oh, you know, uh, Maybe you've been somewhere and you grabbed something and, and, and ate it. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever done I've never done this. Uh, I, not that I'm innocent of sin, but this is just one particular thing I've never done. But uh, I know there are people that will go through and maybe grab grapes there in the grocery store. Maybe take a, a bite or two. 
uh, they go, oh, you know, well, they took the sin, they, they, they took the fruit. The point was they were disobedient to God. And we think, oh, it's just a little sin. It's just a little sin. Does it matter? Well, by the time we get to the next generation, we see the first murder. We went from eating the forbidden fruit to murdering someone's brother. And by the, a matter of fact, by, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, man was so evil and his thoughts were so uh, uh, um, set upon evil all the time. All his thoughts were evil. And there was violence and there was immorality and there were all kinds of things going on as it were in the days of Noah. Jesus said, we're in the days of Noah right now. It's just like the days of Noah right now. The things that went on in Sodom and Gomorrah, the things that went on in the days of Noah, the things that are going on in the United States right now. But we see the judgment of God. God put judgment upon the world because of that sin. Because of that sin that entered in. Because of Adam. Sin entered in because of, uh, of uh, uh, Adam. And because of sin, death entered in. But we see the Savior because Seth means the appointed one. The appointed one. Now, why would you name your son the appointed one? Other than the fact that you're looking to Christ. See, Adam had a son named Seth, and then Seth, throughout his line, there was a man named, named Noah. And we'll look at all these guys a little bit deeper here in just a minute. And through Noah, he had three sons. And through one of his sons, um, Shem, the Abraham was born. Through the line of Abraham, Israel was born. Through the line of Israel, Judah was born. Through the line of Judah, David was born. And through the line of David, we had Christ. Early on, with sin, we see the signs of the Savior. Yes, we are born. Yes, we are caught up in the fall. But all oh, in the Christian life, there has to be a Savior. There has to be an appointed one. There has to be the one that God has designated to go and be that person, to be the Savior. We know the Savior is Jesus Christ. Amen. So we see the birth of the Christian, the, the sin of the Christian, the Savior of the Christian. Now we'll see the death of the Christian in Genesis chapter 50. I said, oh, you're going to you said you're going to preach the whole book and you're already skipping to chapter 50. Don't worry, we're coming back. We're coming back. You're afraid you were going to get out too early, weren't you? No, we're coming back. It says, so Joseph died. Being the being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. We see the death. We see the coffin. Just when God created the world, and as soon as the fall came, we knew that there was a coffin coming. There knew that there was a death to each and every one. There is appointed a time to death, and after this, the judgment. But I want you to know it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there in a coffin in Egypt. When they put our bodies in the coffin, when they put our bodies in the ground, it doesn't end there. Joseph was looking forward to something past that coffin. If we back up just a few verses. Verse 24, Joseph said unto his brother, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land and to the land which he swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry my bones from hence. God had promised Abraham and Isaac 
and Jacob. He promised them a land. He said, I want to go to that land. Don't leave my bones in Egypt. I'm thankful that God has promised that land. I'm glad, I'm glad that, that, that we will not be left in the ground if we know Christ. He was looking forward to the time when his bones would be taken out of Egypt. Egypt, and we'll look at this again a little later on, Lord willing. Egypt is the type of the world. We see a Christian's creation. Now let's look a little bit deeper now. Let's look at the Christ-like comparisons we find in the book of Genesis. Now, first, the comparison we have is Adam. Adam, the first man. As a matter of fact, Adam means man. Did you know that? Adam means man. Eve means mother, or the mother of all living. Adam means man. He's the son. Of, uh, we are the son of man, men, but Jesus was the son of man. Jesus is the son of God, and through him we become sons of God. As we've already pointed out in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, he said that, that he created man in his own image. Adam was created perfect. He was created sinless. Paul, once again, in the book of Romans, calls him the first Adam, and he calls Christ the second Adam. He said, by his transgression, we all fell. We all fell into sin. We all gathered and gained that sin nature. But through Christ and his obedience, we are saved. We gain his righteousness. In Adam, we fell. In Christ, we are raised. In Adam, we were born. But in Christ, we are born again. In Adam, we died. In Christ, we live. By the way, did you know that uh, eternal life is not a promise to the Christian? In the fact, now I, I said that just to get you all as attention because you're like, what is this heretic going to say? It's not a promise because it's not something we're waiting for. It's something we already have. If you're saved, you already have eternal life. Wherever eternal life is mentioned, it talks about a, a, a current possession, not something that we look forward to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now remember who said this? Who said this? John 3, 16. Jesus said this. He said that God gave his only begotten son. Jesus was still alive when he said this. He said, you know, we look back and say, oh, well, God gave his son, meaning he offered up his son. No, Christ was already saying, I mean, that's not a no, but, but Christ was already saying this. Christ had already been given. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, what do they have? They have eternal life. The scripture says, whosoever believeth in him, I believe that's John chapter 6, but, or chapter 5, I can't remember the exact uh, um, chapter and verse. Whosoever believeth in him hath eternal life. You've already got eternal life. You're already blessed with eternal life. So in Adam, we see Christ, the perfect one, but we see that he fell and, and fell short of the glory of God. And Christ came along to fulfill the law, to fulfill, to be obedient, that we might, we might be restored to that place where Adam fell. We've already talked about Seth. Seth was the appointed one. We see Christ in Seth. Seth had a descendant. His name was Noah. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15 calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And a lot of things that we know about Noah, we find out in the New Testament. 
You know, you read Genesis and you think, oh, I'm an expert on Noah, but God reveals things in 2 Peter and in Hebrews about Noah that we didn't know if we just read Genesis. It says he was a preacher of righteousness. You know, I remember when I early on, when I started studying the Bible, and I'm reading the story of Noah, and I'd always heard, you know, them talk about how Noah tried to warn people of the, the, the coming of flood. And they laughed at him, and they mocked him, and they scorned him. And the Bible doesn't get that descriptive about it, but it does say in 2 Peter, he was a preacher of righteousness. You don't find that in Genesis. You just find out that God told him to build the ark. The Bible says that everything that God told Noah to do, he was obedient but in all those years, what was it, 120 years he was building that ark? He was also preaching, warning the people of the wrath to come. 2,000 years since Christ, and we're still trying to warn people of the wrath to come. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He had a message that God had a wrath, that there was an escape from that wrath. God had instructed Noah to build an ark and all that were safe in the ark would be safe from the wrath of God. Christ came and preached and demonstrated that he was he was the embodiment of that ark and the fact that once again Peter writes that Christ was the light figure. In other words that we can picture in the ark Jesus Christ. The message was rejected. They took him. They arrested him. They mocked him. They beat him. They scourged him. Ridiculed him. They hung him on a cross. They crucified him. They allowed him to be buried. And even after he arose, they continued and still today continue to reject the message of Christ. But Noah preached righteousness. He preached his message was rejected, but through his work, humanity was preserved. It is in the finished work of Christ. Can you imagine if Noah didn't finish the work, if he left like one board out of the ark? Or you know how he had to cover it with pitch and, and get it watertight? What, what if there was one area he was like, well, I, you know, I don't, don't think that really needs to be taken care of. But because uh, Noah was obedient and everything God told him to do, humanity was preserved. Because Jesus was obedient in everything that God told him to do, we have salvation. Noah had three sons. Out of one of those sons came a man named Abraham. Abram, when we first read about him. And God told Abraham, he said, I want you to go into a, a place with that, that, that you've never seen, but you'll know. That you'll know. When you get there, I'll let you know when you get there. Through Abraham's faith, he brought his family to a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God, according to Hebrews 11.20. Through the faith of Jesus Christ and the obedience. And once again, Paul in Romans points out how important, how important Abraham's obedience was. If there's no obedience, there, there, there's not faith present, by the way. People will come to me and say, oh, yeah, I believe there's a God. But then they, they, they live as wickedly as they, they, their human nature allows them to live, as they care to live. Abraham has a, had a son. His name was Isaac. Romans 9 tells that he was the promised son. He was the son of promise. He was the, the, the son that God had promised Abraham and Sarah. Now Abraham had other sons. But there was only one chosen son. Only one appointed son. Only one promised son. 
this son, as you probably, I'm sure, are aware of, was laid on an offer of sacrifice. God told Abraham, to take this son, the son that I promised you, the son that, 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 that is going to be in your inheritance, the son that, that is going to ha- uh, garner every promise I gave to you, and take him up on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, which means God will provide. Take him up there. It was a three-day journey. For three days, in Abraham's mind, he's thinking, Isaac's as good as dead. They get there. They, they, they uh, have all the things they need except the sacrifice. People today have all the things they need except the sacrifice. They, they, they've got their money, they've got their wealth, they've got all these, you know, we're caught up in all these things. Isaac says, there's the wood, there, there's the, you know, everything we need. But where's the lamb? Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. And that's what he did. He himself became the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And as he was ready to strike down his son, as his son was laid upon the altar, an angel says, stop. Stop. It is not God's will that you do this. It it is uh, just that you would demonstrate your faith. And behold, there was a lamb, a ram rather, caught in the thicket. And they took that ram and they sacrificed him up to God. Once again, you get to the book of Hebrews, and you don't know this until you get to the book of Hebrews. And it said, Abraham knew that even if his son was sacrificed, he would rise again. That God would bring him anew. Yes, we have the picture of the father sacrificing the son, but only because of the promise that he would raise him again. By the way, this son, this son, Isaac, as he grew up, his, his father said, you know, you need a wife. You need a wife. Now, this wasn't Facebook official, by the way, like Brother Reuter. But what he did, he sent his servant out. In the servant, we see a picture of the Holy Spirit because the father sends the Holy Spirit out to find him a Gentile bride. This was not a Hebrew woman. This was a woman back there where Abraham had come from. The Father sent out the Holy Spirit to gather him up a Gentile bride. A bride made up of people outside of the fleshly children of Abraham. We are the believers, the the baptized believers in the Lord's church are part of that Gentile bride today. Isaac had a son. He named him actually two sons, Esau and Jacob. We always say Jacob and Esau, but Esau was born first. He was the older, but God had chosen Jacob. They gave him the name Supplanter. Basically, somebody's going to take something that didn't belong to him. But God changed his name to Israel. It means he who has power with God, or the prince that has power of God. Israel is a picture of the eternal promise of God. God promised Abraham this nation. Israel's still around today. Israel has been persecuted, it has been destroyed, it has been scattered, and it's still standing. Out of this eternal uh, promise, there is a mighty nation spread throughout the world.
Israel had a son. It's all we're getting to Joseph now, right? No. His son's name was Judah. Judah. Now, uh, Joseph, as we'll look here in just a minute, was a, a perfect type of Christ. But Christ came out of the line of Judah. He's referred to as the Lion of Judah. His forefather was not Joseph. It was Judah. See, Judah begat a man named Pharaoh from Tamar, who was an Egyptian. Once again, we see we see the son married the people of God in a combination. Remember I told you earlier Egypt meant the, it was a, a type of the world? So we see the people of God and the world. Jesus Christ came from an earthly woman and a heavenly father. He was completely God and completely man. All at the same time. Fairies, I think, as I tried to count them out, he had like six or seven generations after him. But in that generation, whether it was six or seven, it was there was a man born. His name was Boaz. And he had a son. His son's name was Jesse. You ever heard of the root of Jesse? That's Jesus. Jesse had a son. His name was David. And we see the line of Jesus coming through Judah from a man named Pharaohs, who was the child of an Egyptian, which is a type of the world. But we get to Genesis chapter 44. And if you know the story, Judah and his brothers had a brother whose name was Joseph. They were envious of Joseph. Joseph was the chosen son. He was the heir of promise. He was given a coat of many collars, which would indicate he was going to get the inheritance from his father. And they were envious of him. And they decided, hey, let's kill him. Let's kill him. We'll tell the guy. Uh, we'll tell Dad that his he was killed by a wild animal. And they took his coat and they covered it with blood, brought it back to his father. They said, "Joseph, your son is dead." But what they did, they decided. Reuben, the oldest, said, "No, let's don't kill him." They threw him in a pit. And these Ishmaelites came through. The Ishmaelites were the children of Abraham, by the way. They were all, also offspring of Abraham. And they knew that they were Ishmaelites, it says, because they were men and they were wearing earrings. I'm not even going to preach on that. You think about that. And they took him into Egypt and they sold him into slavery. And as we'll look, may, maybe tonight, because we're probably not going to have time to cover Joseph in his entirety uh, this morning. But you know the story. He was, uh, he was in slavery and he was put over Potiphar's house because he, he, God was blessing him. He was accused of, uh, of a crime and uh, was uh, put into prison. While he was in prison, he met... Uh, the uh, butler and the baker for Pharaoh and he interpreted their dreams and a couple years later Pharaoh had this dream that he, that he needed an interpreter and they brought Joseph in he interpreted the dream um, and Pharaoh put him in charge of everything and the dream said there was going to be a famine in the land so what he did was he stored up, stored up, stored up stored up the seven good years Till the seven years of famine came, and when no one else had bread, there, were, there was bread in the house of Pharaoh. Guess who needed bread? Israel's family. 
He sent his sons, except for the youngest, Benjamin, because that was uh, also the child from Rachel, his favorite wife. And he sent his sons into Egypt to beg for bread from the man. And I was going to save this for later, but I can't, I can't hold this back. When Joseph was in the pit, when Joseph was in the pit, it said they were sat around. It says there's no water in the pit. So he doesn't have anything to drink. And they sat around the pit eating bread. You would assume they're not giving bread to him either. They're eating bread. Years pass. They're there in Egypt begging bread from Joseph. Joseph recognizes them. They don't recognize him. So he sets it up. So Simon would be caught up. Well, number one, he said, I don't believe who you are. I think you're spies. So he kept Simon back. He said, bring your younger brother. When they brought the younger brother, he set him up and, and, and they planted on him a silver cup that they would say, okay, you, you tried to steal this cup. You know what Judah did? He said, no, take me. He said, we, we've already take my, took my father's son and took him from him and broke his heart. And now the son of his old age is going to be taken from him to take me in his place. Judah, the ancestor of Jesus, was willing to offer himself up in the place of his brother to appease, to satisfy his father. Tell me, Jesus says it throughout the book of Genesis. Now I'll try to be quick here. We'll get to the culmination of the chronicle. As I said, we took a broad view and we saw the, 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 the birth, the life, the, the judgment, the sin, the death, and the hope of the resurrection for the Christian in the book of Genesis. We see the types of Christ, the types of the Savior in the book of Genesis. And probably the most perfect type of Christ we find in the Bible is found in this man Joseph we've been talking about. We first see him in Genesis chapter 37, as we said, and, and as I'm sure you're probably familiar with, you've heard the stories, you've heard the, the preaching, you've heard the Sunday school teachers tell you about this man, Joseph. He was born, he was the father's chosen son uh, out of 12. He was the one, he was sent out by his father to check on his brothers. Now they said, you, you, you've been sent out here just to, 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 to harass us, but basically I believe it was to see if they needed anything, to take care of their needs. But he was hated by his brothers. He was cast into a pit, as we said. There was no water. Do you remember there was a man A couple thousand years later. He was cast into a pit. Eventually. The writer of the song wrote, he was in a miry pit. But this, 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 this man was hung up on a cross. And he said seven things that were recorded while he was on the cross. And one of the things he said was, I thirst. So here is Joseph, who was cast into a pit by his brothers. He, he, is, he is sentenced to death by his brothers. And he is thirsty. They gathered around the pit that evening. They were eating bread. He had no bread. You get to Genesis chapter 43. They come to him begging bread. You know what he did? He gave him bread. He gave him bread. He gave him bread. He 
verse, or chapter 47, verse 12, and it says he gave bread to all their families. Then later on we read that he gave bread to all of Egypt. Then we get to Genesis, or John chapter 6. This man comes along and says, I am the bread of life. Everyone that was in contact with him received bread. We see the bread of life. Jesus Christ is the sustainer of life. He is the bread of life. He's in the pit. The Ishmaelites come by. They sell him, his brothers sell him. You know what they took in exchange for Joseph? Silver. Silver. It says they, he, he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Our Lord was sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of inflation, I guess. But silver was the price. For their betrayal. They told their father he was dead. To Israel, Joseph was dead all those years. Then they had to turn around and years later say, Joseph's alive. Joseph was the one who was dead in his father's eyes, but then was alive. Jesus was the one, but Revelation says, I'm the one who, who died and lived. So now he's in the place of power. They come to him begging for bread. He has the ability to do anything he wants to them to do to them. And you know what he did? He forgave them. Their offense against him was great, and yet he forgave them. My offense to the Lord is great. And I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm already forgiven. Not only did he forgive them, he put them in a place of prominence. They were a prominent family now in Egypt. Out in the world, they were a prominent family. We are a prominent people. We are a peculiar people placed in a special land. He set aside a portion of land called Goshen in which they lived. Then we get to Genesis chapter 50. Joseph died. He was put in a coffin. But he wasn't put, you know, the, in Egypt they would put you in the, in, in the pyramids, they would put you in some kind of mausoleum, they would put you, they, 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 the people of Israel kept his body. Why? Because he said, I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the place of promise. He was placed basically in a temporary tomb. Jesus was placed in a tomb. There was a gospel song back in the 90s. I only need it for the weekend. That borrowed tomb wasn't given to him. What, he didn't need it for long. He needed it for three days. We preach today about a resurrected Savior. We preach about the, 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 the sin that brought him to death. Not his sin, but the sins of the world. How he overcame. How he forgave those who had committed the offense against him. Even on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know one how they did. Because of his forgiveness, his people were saved. I already said the scriptures say, whosoever believeth in him hath eternal life. Do you believe in him today? Will you trust him today? This Bible is too amazing and miraculous to be a fable. 
not only the words that are written down, the, the consistency of, uh, of the scripture over thousands of years, the promises that have been kept, but around you, you see men and women whose lives have been changed. Not just their physical lives, their eternal life has been changed. Would you trust in Christ today? Sister Connie, if you would come, if everyone will stand, Let's turn to number 428.